What's good, everybody? This is your boy, Paul, the fifth bit. I'm in my van at the gas station. I forgot to take a video of me leaving the studio, but I'm on my way back to my hometown, Evansville, Indiana. I'm doing a few studio tours there. I'm going to document the entire trip. All right. All right, guys, I probably shouldn't be vlogging while I'm driving on the interstate, but yet here I am. I'm taking a different route today. I'm taking 65 north instead of 24 because Boonville is on the other side of where I live from Evansville. But just to give you an example, I live in the Berry Hill area in Nashville. It's like going from Berry Hill to Gallant. Overall, it's a smooth drive. It's a little cloudy and overcast it's like it may rain. So I'm hoping things will clear up once we get to the studio bar. All right, catch you in a few. I'm talking about America. Look at that landscape. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Must be a big in Tennessee. I wish I could take my drone out and get footage of this. Well, I made it guys. I am here in my hometown of Evansville, Indiana. I'm actually off the beaten path just a little bit. I'm in Boonville, which is about 20 minutes away. Normally when I do these interviews, I've actually already met my host. This situation is a little different. I haven't actually met John. We connected last year through the pandemic on social media and he has been gracious enough to welcome me out to his uh, studio. It's a barn that he's converted. Let's go check it out. Wow, this is amazing in here. Hey, Paul. Well, hey, John. How's it going? I'm good. Thanks for having me out. It's finally good to meet you in person here. It's cool to connect on social media last year, and here we are. And I hope you had a good drive up from Nashville. It's, yeah, uh, everything was smooth, uneventful. and I always like going down there myself, too. Well, welcome to the studio barn. Thank you. It's, uh, it's my little kind of nest out in the, out in the country. And studio barn is a barn. <laughs> yeah, the name implies exactly what it is. So yeah, this is very cool. This control room from Rock and Tail. I love the natural wood and everything in here. So it was kind of a long, long process to get to this point, but uh, everything's worked out so far. And I just hope it continues. Cool. Uh, <laughs> well, it definitely looks like a place that I'd love to come to record. So I guess we can go ahead and get started. Yeah, more of a voiceover room in here. Well, first of all, we have a, this is kind of our voiceover room. It was designed to, if you were in this room, you could still see everybody if you were working with a band. But, and we do some singing overdubs in here, but mainly uh, voiceovers and any kind of reading to book type things. Very simple, just kind of an extra uh, room from the control room. We'll put an amp in here sometimes, a guitar amp or something like that, or acoustic guitar can play in here and be really close to the control room and just doing overdubs. Gotcha. So, do you ever do any uh, voiceovers or podcasts? Haven't done a lot of podcasting, but things for like book book reads and things like that are popular among some people. They can get long. Having something really close to the control room is an asset where you're not walking all the way into the big room or anything like that. Just having a, this extra little space. And of course, sometimes I just kind of throw my junk in here. As you can see, we got a little... Uh, electronic drum kit that we don't usually play in here, but sometimes I'll even hook it up uh, from this spot. Like this is probably, I would say center of the room maybe. Yeah. But it just, it feels good in here. There's a very natural, just kind of a echo in the room. I imagine that probably portrays into some of the recordings. A little bit. I'm still kind of developing this room a little bit because we do most of our vocal I get them out in the big room when we've got a bigger expanse, but I didn't want to just flatten this room totally out. It's it's a little bit, it's a little little boomy in some areas, but you can work with it. Mainly big vocals, big room. Sure, I imagine acoustic guitar sounds pretty cool. Yeah, now acoustics, sit down acoustics and things like that. It's a very nice. That's why I didn't want to flatten it so much. You know, loses its flavor. Sure. But there's not a lot of standing waves here. 
I don't usually put bass guitar or anything like that in here. So, gotcha, yeah. like I say, it's the it's the extension of the control room that makes it a, a nice asset. I, I just love the fact that you can be in here recording and see the rest of the band, or if it's just like you said, uh, voiceover, you can see the engineer and have that communication still mm -hmm. and that camaraderie, and that's very important. And that's that's kind of what makes it comfortable comfortable for people. They're not. Uh, they're not too isolated. They're right there kind of with them. So exactly, because if you've never been in a recording studio and you're probably coming in for the first time, I'm sure you get a lot of artists that may be a little nervous. They're putting their heart and soul into a mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. and they're around somebody that they may not know too well and just having that, being able to see the person that you're working with, I'm sure mm -hmm. adds a ton of confidence to that overall outcome of the recording. Yeah, it's got just enough isolation to for sound to do do what you want it to do, but then you're still in the mix with the engineer mainly when you're doing the kind of things you would do in here. Cool. So you talked about the live room. Can we go out and see that? Yeah, let's go. Awesome. Come on in. This is this is the main room. This is kind of where everything happens. It's set up with all the XLRs and the inputs to go into the control room and record. And it's also set up with its own independent PA system where you don't even have to turn anything else on. You just come in here and it can, you can use it just like a jam practice room. Uh, everything's independent, works on its own without any of the recording gear going on. And then when you're ready, so you can rehearse for a while. And then when you're ready to record, we just switch over to the other system, which goes into the recording part of the studio. It's band friend, very band friendly, very solo artistic friendly. People will come in here and play their acoustic and just kind of get practiced up and then we'll switch to record mode and it's it makes for a comfortable, easy flow. It's not so rigid. Most people really like it, the comfort of it. It's very, it feels very spacious, very homey. Could you kind of maybe tell me some of the dimensions of the room? I know it's kind of... Well, uh, the building from control room on is, is 32 this way and 32 this way. Okay. We kind of take a little bit of pride in the way the ceiling is because the ceiling okay. is done with the burlap. There's uh, six to eight inches of insulation and the ceiling is really what brings the kind of brings the flavor down to the to the floor, really. Gotcha. And of course, the wooden floor kind of helps out. I'm not totally done with with my ISO and stuff in here, mm -hmm. but it's got a good sound. It's not verbish, but it's not super dead either. Yeah, there's uh, just us talking. I don't feel like there's a lot of reflections or wow and flutter or any, any odd frequencies. It sounds pretty good. Mainly it's that big standing wave Mm -hmm. that you want to kind of get out of a room like this. You're not wanting to isolate, totally isolate it down, but over here, I don't have my mar little Marshall in here yet, but this is kind of an amp section, guitars, some ribbon mics up to some amps, and then I've got a guitar section over here with some amps. In the live room, I've got a small jazz kit set up, and this is where when drummers come in and stuff, they can set their kit up here. I can, I'll tear this down. I literally switch from this kit to the drum room when we record. So what will end up happening is uh, people will rehearse out here and then when we go to record, and they, they, have, their, they have their choice. They can, if they're kind of a jazz kind of drummer, small kit, it's, it's here. If it's up here, it's more of a rock kit. Everything goes into the same preamps uh, when the recording starts. We utilize this out here, having the drummer out here too, a lot with just rehearsing a band come in here, myself included, will come in here and we'll just play. We won't be recording at all. Gotcha. Uh, like I say, everything's hooked up. Uh, kind of wander back here. This is kind of my area. I kind of control the PA here. We've got a couple other keyboards we switch in and out. And uh, but this is the other. The other. This is just the live PA. This, like I say, this is totally independent from the recording. Mainly, you know, like a garage band would have a PA set up in their garage. This is kind of what it is, a glorified garage. Yeah. But then you got the recording part side of it too, so. Very awesome. So what kind of uh, console or mixer do you have back there for the okay, this live is, space? This is just a, it's a Soundcraft. I've done the Mackie thing for years and I just, the Soundcraft to me is a little nicer. And, uh, but it's, a, it's just like I say, it's independent from the recording. This is not what we record with. 
Right. It's just, it's the live PA here. And of course with iTunes and all the different things, we just get on, get online, we pick out cover songs, pick out songs we want to do. And we can actually do some rough recording, real quick stuff out here to kind of pass around and learn songs. But mainly this is just, like I say, the playing. And then when we want to record, everything's hooked up to just switch over to recording. More guitar amps, kind of this, I use a lot of this stuff over here. And I've got an array of keyboards that we just switch in and out here. So what do like, you got over here? Is that a, that a steel? Oh, that, no, that's a, that's a, that's a case to my my Fender oh, guitar. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. And, you know, a lot of people coming in, they look they look at the, all this stuff. Wow, how did you get all this? Well, I've been doing this a, a few years. And, Inbox. Inbox oh, yeah. 2 yeah. from 2008. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to get rid of stuff, and then, well, you can't get a lot for it unless it's some kind of classical instrument or something like that. Some of the stuff I just keep to look at. I don't use some of it very much, but most of it I do. I've got a little rolling keyboard here I use a lot, and one of my favorite, just, it's a real simple piano. It's a little Kurzweiler, but it's got one of the best just straight piano sounds that I've found, uh, and it's an older keyboard. You can find stuff like that out there that uh, can can be utilized in the studio, and I, sometimes I use that as an excuse too, because I oh I could get that for the studio, and it might be a banjo or something or a, a ukulele that I never play, but it, I, I want it in the studio in case somebody can play it. For sure. Yeah. Well, for me, my whole musical journey started with the keyboard. It was uh -huh. in uh, 1992. My dad got us an Sonic SQ2. Oh yeah, yeah. At the time, in '92, there was like this little card is a ROM card mm -hmm. and you'd plug it in and it's now like the equivalent of a USB stick right. so it would have 99 sounds and banks on that, it. Did it have the sequencer built in where you yep. sequence yeah I remember that keyboard yeah so yeah. it was great and it had uh, some pre-programmed songs built in that was one of the better at the time was one of the better keyboards around because especially with the, the sequencer you could sequence all those things and then hit a button and play to it. And, uh huh. Yeah. And that's how I first got my engineering and recording experiences with that. With the and sequencer. With the sequencer. Yeah. And it had 16 channels, I believe, on it. We had this big, kind of amp like that, is about a big 18 inch amp, had a speaker on it, and some EQ knobs and things. And mm -hmm. I'd plug a $10 microphone into that and then like mm -hmm. try to sing and things on top of that with my music playing out. That was my first experience with adding effects, overdubbing, and actual mm -hmm. recording, and doing all that stuff. Well, and you know, a, a DAW is a sequencer. Yeah. I mean, and when you use the word sequencer, it's like, what's that mean? No, it's it's, it's a recorder. Records different tracks. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember that keyboard. That's uh, That goes a ways back. Well, and still to this day, while I'm here, I'm going to my parents' house. I'm going to get it out. I brought my Apollo Twin with me, so I'm going to hook it up and try to get some sounds. And, Do something. Heck yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. So here we are almost, what, 30 years later, yeah. trying to get that thing out and still put it to use. And Yeah, when you, when you say 1990s, you think, well, that was just 10 years. No, that was not 10 years ago. That's 30 years ago now. I know. <laughs> so when you say <laughs> 70s, that's 50 years ago. <laughs> I probably was not even thought of or <laughs> thought back then in the 70s. Yeah, that's kind of my, the 70s was, is where I... Uh, that's when I started chipping on the guitar and the drums. I played drums for years and then uh, always had an acoustic guitar and writing songs and things like that. But I cut my teeth in the in the early 70s and I still think 70s was the best music. That's debatable with everybody I know, but I think 70s personally still had the best bands. I uh, agree. I mean, check this out. <laughs> my kids are listening to Queen and Boston and Rush and all these bands that it's like, wow, that's kind of, I'm kind of proud of that. I think once we get in the control room, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but everything is recorded on tape, analog, exactly. and if you messed up, you'd either have to do it again or maybe try to cut that tape. And Splice tape was a There's was no a recording, thing. no Pro Tools, no, oh, we'll do it 130 times until we get that perfect take. Or, or was, choose the best ones out of all the ones that you can do. The it was and, raw. It was real. It was mm -hmm. how it was done, and that's why those recordings were the quality that you got. Yeah, it's almost, in a lot of ways, it's almost too easy now. You would kind of take it for granted. A lot of the younger people today don't really know what you had to do back then. And and 
the cost. You couldn't afford it. Recording studios, if if you were a garage band, you couldn't go to a recording studio. A recording studio was a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. Now you have the ability to, to do this kind of thing and be artistic like this. I encourage everybody to do it. I encourage all young people to, to pick up an instrument. Back then, it was a lot tougher. We take a lot of stuff for granted. And back in the day, you know, the band would come into the room, not a recording studio, but the band would come into the room, and we didn't even have tuners. I mean, everybody would start bing, 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 bing. Everybody would tune. We'd spend the first 10 minutes tuning up the whole band. Now you just reach up, and you got a little tuner hooked to your guitar, and everybody's tuned up, and we take that for granted. And you know, Like you say, back back then the tapes, oh, cassette tapes and eight track tapes and the reel to reels. If you, if you had a reel to reel, now you were getting close to a recording studio, but you still weren't there yet. Well, even like a room like this, if you would have had the Beatles in there, oh I my. think George oh Martin had a four track <laughs> recorder. So you'd have Ringo back in the corner and then you'd have the other members of the band maybe one mic overhead on drums, mm -hmm. uh, guitar, and then uh, Paul McCartney singing. If the drums are too loud, they might take that fader down a little bit, or they might, I even saw some old recordings from the 20s where they had the whole band in a room with one microphone. Mm -hmm. So when it would come up for like a trumpet solo, mm -hmm. like the trumpet player would move up and then they would move oh, back. Yeah. Yeah. And then if there's like a tuba player, they would kind of do the same thing and everybody mm -hmm. would kind of move accordingly to when that solo came well, up. Well, and back then they would take those four tracks and they would dump it on another machine down to two tracks and then they would dump that back and then they'd have two more tracks to put on those and they would do that several times and that was called degradation. Mm -hmm. So every time you did that, you lost a little something. Well, you don't have any of that now. I mean, you lay out a hundred tracks and you can just start record record 10 tracks and then record one track at a time after that and you have no degradation no slip in quality or anything it's just amazing what what you have today and what can actually be done in today's world with with audio yeah what are, one of the things i really tried to accomplish with this i set everything up so everybody could see but mainly when you're in this room like two acoustic guitar players can be sitting here together and uh, be comfortable. And that's that's one thing in studios, sometimes they can be just real cold. And that will reflect in the music. If you can make them comfortable, if you can get a good good quality sound through their headphones, whether, whether they're hearing themselves and the other musicians good, that's really important because that's gonna translate into the final product. I totally agree, 2,000% on that. Part of being an engineer or producer is a little bit of psychology. You've mm -hmm. got to encourage and coax that artist to produce their best in that mm -hmm. high pressure situation. One thing I wanted to ask about this room is it's a very unique room. I like the way it's structured. Is there a sweet spot in here for like an acoustic guitar and vocal? as far as finding the For me, uh, being in the center of, of, of a room is a good place because you get the bigness of the room. But the L shape to it, where you can put a guitar over there and a guitar over here, you've got some isolation, but then you can still, you've got good communication because a lot of times you get a band going or, or a couple soloists going, you want to be able to communicate with them gospel group was in here last night oh, and cool. uh, they sing to tracks and it was very important for them to be able to see each other so i basically put them in a triangle out here and i put the main whoever was singing the lead at the time i put him down on one end and then i put the basically the harmony to the gospel trio down on this end and it made for a comfortable situation and there was still enough isolation that I can use in playlists and things like that in the, in the recorder. I can still get separation, but they still were, were they were comfortable with the headphone mix, and they were real comfortable being able to see each other to end up with a good product in the end. Where I'm just sit, kind of sitting back, letting them do their thing. Yeah, that is so key. Not only my engineer, I play drums and bass. Mm -hmm. So like right here would be a 
pretty good spot or maybe where you're sitting, a great spot to look over at the drummer because if I'm oh, playing yeah. drums. This, this is the bass player's spot, really. I mean, I got the bass amp right here. Yeah. And just to look, just to be right on with that. Because when I'm playing those drums, I'm hitting those skins, I got to have that communication with my bass player no matter what side of the stage mm -hmm. they're on because you just got that energy flowing and that vibe. And when you have a drummer and a bass or keys playing, that's mm -hmm. a rhythm section. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be tight. Yeah, I like this room layout, and I think it's perfect for that. Every band's a little bit different. Some bands like a they like a live sound. They like everything just live, and they don't like a lot of editing. They just want to what it is is what it is. Kind of like the Neil Young, that was the take. Well, then you got the others that want to, that that really want perfection in every little thing, and and the and the isolation is important there. If you don't have it, you'll have bleed over two guitars or whatever, and given people the either one either or that's what you have to do when you're in a position like this where you're you're having people come in and they've got different ideas on how to do stuff and and you've got to kind of format your you got to be ready in the room for that i did want to ask you about that i know you have a lot of bands come in where they can not only rehearse here but they can track as a full band mm -hmm. do you do that a lot where everybody's playing together and you record it or do you do like maybe drums first then you have the bass come in and then build on that song piece by piece i think i've done it every way you can think of but yeah. I, the main probably the main way is to come in and get your basics first mm -hmm. your drum and bass and some kind of rhythm from a to z through the whole song and get that get that to where that everything's foundation. in time, the foundation, the blocks of the song, get that down and then build it from there. Because then you can bring your saxophones in and your lead players in and stuff like that. But if you get a strong melodic instrument, bass and drums, if you get them tracked well from A to Z through the whole song, now, now you can literally come back to that song. You don't even have to have those players there anymore. You can come back with the guitar player or the vocalist and the producer and just work on those those other parts that go along with it. What we usually do though, and I call that the basic tracks, we throw a scratch vocal down mm -hmm. and the, the scratch vocal just kind of keeps everybody where they need to be in the song. And in a lot of cases, the scratch vocalist can even talk in the microphone because it's not being recorded. That, that scratch vocalist can talk in there and say, okay, we got a, we got a bridge coming up here or whatever. He can actually cue people through the mic. It's not being recorded, but then he comes back after those basics are all laid down. He or she puts puts their part down, and then build the harmonies around that. And I mean that's one way I've done it without drums and actually to a click track. And then the drummer has actually came in and and played to that. It, it's not the norm, but it's it can be done in a lot of different ways. And mm -hmm. your Dawes. Today, for songwriters, there's some really good DAW programs out there that have drummers within them. Yep. And you can start with a drum. You can be energized from just a drum drummer playing. Some people can get really motivated by, okay, there's the drummer, now I'm going to start playing something to that. And that's the way people build songs. So it can be done. Timing, and I know you know this, timing is very important to stay, you know, Having that click track or some kind of shaker or some kind of rhythm going to keep you, your your timing, your measures in the right proportion all the way through the song versus just start to play without anything and the song kind of goes like this. That's kind of that's, it's kind of tough. I have mixed emotions about that. Uh, I feel like being an engineer in Nashville, everything is on the grid. Uh -huh. it's, everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. Any studio I've ever been at or like rehearsal hall, mm -hmm. we've always had spot for a click. Even at church, we have click tracks, but mm -hmm. everything's kind of timed for like video mm -hmm. to go with it. But sometimes I like to do live recordings and to just get the emotion, let, let the, it just let the feel flow. Go. And sometimes when you just let go and don't have the mm -hmm. click, mm -hmm. those are just some of the most ups and downs. Mm -hmm. It's just the flow of it, I feel like is just some of the I've had some of the best recordings that way. Yeah, and you're you're dealing with people there too that that are good enough to they're probably within the click pretty well. I'm kind of like you. I don't use quantizing a lot because quantizing brings things almost into just a too straight of a because there is a little bit of human give and go there. You know, studio drummers. I've always said this: guitar players are a dime a dozen. Studio drummers are really hard to find. 
I mean, the drummer that can come in and keep the whole group in a good position, just in the groove, just right in the, that drummer, you hear this phrase all the time, in the pocket, yep. that drummer's in the pocket. When you say that, you know what, I, you know, you know what, the, what that means, because yep. they're, when they come around a roll or the chorus happens, when they come back out of that, they haven't sped up. And the vocalist isn't going blah, 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 to get his words out because, you know, that's the point. If the song's going to speed up, that's where it's going to be. It's things like that. But yeah, I know what I know what you mean about just a rigid. And I have a lot of people they don't like a click track, and you know I don't try and argue with them. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll put like a shaker, mm -hmm. which isn't so straight. It gives you a little bit of play, but it also keeps you in the groove. It does. You know, with with less experienced players, especially. So now we're in the drum room, so let's talk drums. One thing that you said in there that brought back some memories was that studio drummers are hard to find, and that, that's, that's very true. I was auditioning at a church one day, and they were like, we need drummers so bad, everybody's out on the road right now. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, cool. But can you kind of tell me about your drum kit? This is kind of set up more of a rocky kind of kit. Each drum is mic'd. I've got a mic on the top of the snare and the bottom of the snare. And during the editing process, I like to kind of mix those together. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a lot more rasp from the bottom of the snare. You're going to get a lot more pop from the top of the snare. And kind of mixing those or taking one totally out sometimes is what you want. Sometimes I'll change snares. I'll go to a thinner piccolo, oh, I love a different, different kind of snare sound. Like I said, there's literally a mic on every instrument down here. My my overheads in this setup are mainly, since I've got the toms mic'd, they're not really set up to take the lower frequencies from the kit. They're more to grasp the cymbals. More cymbals. And... This one over here is really situated towards the ride cymbal. So when I, when I get into the editing room and I want ride or I want less ride, I, I've, I've got a place to go. And then my overhead picks up the symbols as a whole. And of course the hi-hat is, is on its separate channel. There's uh, 10, 10 mics in this room on this drum kit. Okay. I've got a lot of fluctuation. And it's very important, like, and I, I know as you as a drummer know, to tune your drums and have your drums tuned because you don't think drums have a tone, they do. And if they're not tuned right, they can sound off. And, and then having the right less muffle, more muffle type of sound. You had the old Beatles albums where Ringo was playing. Well, some of those, some of those uh, drums, literally, they use wash rags and stuff to make them sound different in different songs and things. Using your, I use le these little gels. I know you probably use those. Uh, like moon gels? And, yeah, moon gels and some rings and stuff to just dampen down the, there's a woomphiness to drums when you mic them. And a lot of people use gates. I don't use any gating on this in here. I've got separation without that, and I sometimes I let that bleed over, because in the, in the end, when you take your drum kit down, you're you're really, it's a totality. It's the kit. It's the whole kit. Yeah, you've got all these pieces, but in the end, it's one instrument. It's one instrument. And if you've got your with different frequencies, <laughs> so many frequencies, highs from your cymbals to the lows, low to mid range on your toms. In a room like this, you probably wouldn't need a gate, I wouldn't think a whole lot. I've done it, but just kind of a side note is, is here, if, you, if you're not really good at gating, they can, it can get you in trouble. It's an art for sure, having to yeah. learn all the settings and everything. Kind of like my kit, I have a PDP X7, it's a, I call it a Frankenstein kit. It's mm -hmm. a mixture of different things. It came with three rack toms, two floor toms. It was an 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. Mm -hmm. I turned the 8 inch into a sub kick, so that was pretty cool. Then I've got the 12, 14, and 16 kind of Nashville style, but then my snare. I have two hi hats. I have a standard 14, and then I have a 15 over here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got mm -hmm. three cymbals, two overheads, like you said, the snare top and bottom. And you're a right-handed drummer. I am. Yeah. I've, so you have your high, you do a little right-handed high act thing Yeah, too? I've got one like on this side, one uh -huh. here, then I've mm -hmm. got my uh, ride kind of above that. Mm -hmm. I have a variety of mics for different tones. I've mm -hmm. got stereo pair that are overhead. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll switch out overheads. I mm -hmm. really like that one right there. 
I have uh, some slate mics that I use mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. And then I have two on my kick. I have a kick in, I've got a kick out. Mm -hmm. And then I have about three to four different room mics that I kind of mm -hmm. like blend in for added effect, wide panning, overheads out, pan in. Just so mm -hmm. that way, like you said, it's one instrument, but you can make it as big or as small or as tight, however you need it to sound for that particular mm -hmm. track. I've got kind of an array of mics here, the Beta 57s, or fit, I'm sorry, Beta 56, mainly designed for toms, but I, I've got them on the three toms. And then I use the Telenfunk on the top of the snare, which I used an SM57, which by the way, this isn't an SM57 commercial, but if, if you're just starting out with miking drums, get you some SM57s because they're the, they're the standard in, in a lot of top-notch studios. They, go down, they even go down to that. So you don't have to have just super expensive mics. You can do well. And I've got a Shure, uh, the, the uh, Beta 52, 52 in the kick drum. I'm a Sure guy. I know this is not a Sure commercial, but I'm kind of a Sure guy. I've got the SM81 at the top. All those things do a little bit better for the instrument they're on. But if you're a drummer just starting out and you say, well, I want to mic my drums, you can't go wrong with an SM57. And, and even in vocals, an SM58. They're good mics. and Yeah. Uh, John Cooper from uh, Springsteen. Springsteen would use a 58 on his live shows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Real quick, can you tell me about this mic here on your floor, Tom? Well, you know what? I'm going to have to... I bought that with a kit, and I'm going to have to look at actually... Uh, let me see here. Yeah, let's do a little commercial here. It's a, it's a mic tech. Okay. That came from a drum kit, and it was for the actually for the kick drum gotcha. out, of this, out of this kit. So I threw it on a bigger Tom. It's... Uh, attitude is to grab something a little bit a little lower. Low I positioned it there. Not real super familiar with it, but I, I got it, got a kit. I mean, I'm actually, I'm using a couple of the mics out there. Sometimes you can buy mics in a kit. You'll have like three mics you can put on your tom. You'll have a kick drum mic. You might have a, a snare mic or something like that, and you'll buy them as a kit. And as a package, you'll get them cheaper as, rather than buying them in, individually. So a lot of a lot of stuff around here, I, I just use what I got. And mm -hmm. If I got it, I'll put it, try and put it in the best place. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we we've experimented from live to studio sessions on four toms a lot of times, but mm. we've even used Beta 52s on the oh yeah toms yeah, yeah. four twenty ones. And if I had another one, I'd probably put that there too. The yeah. symbols are the symbols are real. F these are the Sabian. They're, they're studio symbols that are real fast. It, it's not really a, a live big stage symbol, and they record well. Symbols, when some people look at symbols and they see the price, it's like, how can you pay that much for a symbol? Well, it's it's in the quality. That's part of your instrument. Um, Drum kits aren't cheap, no. but you can, it, you know, for anybody out there, you know, that's just starting too, you can build yourself up, just like with the mics. I mean, you don't have to start out with any mics at all, and then when you do start. You know, start with a few of the right ones, but you don't have to spend a lot of money. I'm always about getting quality at the best price. Don't go overboard, but... For sure. I agree. What, what do you have up here? Uh, looks like some kind of condenser. Yeah, that's that's another one. It's it's like I've had it forever. It's a... What is it again? A, a Rode, maybe? Yeah, that's the Rode NT1. I couldn't remember if I had that one out there or in here. Yeah, it's, it's a Rode NT1, which... If you're starting out, if you're starting out recording, this is a good all-around condenser mic for vocals, uh, acoustic, anything really. This is a good, decent quality mic at a decent price. And like I say, I'm not a mic salesman, but well, uh, that, that's true. I have a stereo pair of those. I use for overheads. I use them for mm -hmm. rooms. Mm -hmm. I use them for acoustic guitar and vocal at the same time mm -hmm. or tracking. I actually put it on a stand-up bass one time on the bottom, and then I used I actually used my two overheads, and we we moved the drums up a little bit, and I had a stand-up bass back here, and and used the the road on the bottom of the stand-up bass, and then the the Shure SM81 on the top, and got a pretty decent got the got the click of the bass, you know how you mm -hmm. want that that stand-up bass, you want that kind of that click in there, uh, and I got that low whoopy. Gotcha. Uh, that real low sound too. So, the placement of the mics is another thing. 
place them, if the drummers are real wild all over the skins, place them back a little bit because they'll hit the mics. <laughs> I've had that happen. <laughs> so one question I'm very curious to know about, and here you've got more of a drum isolation room. Mm -hmm. Do you ever keep that door open and maybe like place a mic out in the live room just to get some natural ambience and like blend that in? I have <laughs> fought drum issues from, you know, using two digital drum kits so I could get separation between the snare or two digital heads like on a rolling kit so I, I could get separation between snare and, and kick and then kit. I've put mics around rooms and not necessarily just done that. I, I don't know that I've ever put a mic out there to get the drums but hey it's something you kind of work through. You, you keep developing and then when you find that sound that you can really work with in the editing room that you, you're somewhat pleased with kind of stay with that but then you're always open for change because listen to any song and the drums are different mm -hmm. you know listen to a John Fogarty song or listen to a collective soul song or listen to uh, the Eagles the way he his drums the, the tone the just the way everything is is different on drums it's one of the most expandable instruments you can have because you've got so many things and there's so many different ways they can sound. Yeah, there's so many cymbal companies from Zildjian to Sabian to, I think out there you might have some pasties possibly. Yeah. I think I've got a little Drum bit of heads. I think I, I think I got a Mido rug out there. <laughs> okay. I don't have any cymbals of that brand, but mm -hmm. yeah, but for younger people, use what you got and take every little thing up another level as you can because with with my studio, this just this didn't happen over day. I've been doing this since the early '70s, and or some sort of music, and I've just kind of collected stuff and got stuff, and I knew stuff that I wanted in certain areas, and saved and got it, and sometimes didn't save, and I went ahead and got it anyway. And uh, but it's an addiction. It, it it doesn't yeah it doesn't happen overnight. But if you're if you're into recording, start out small. And like you, you know, you know the ropes. Just kind of keep expanding it. Years ago, I bought this drum set, and years ago, I bought that piano out there, and then just a few months ago, I bought that a guitar. So it just uh, you add to it, but now it looks like man, there's all this stuff, and it didn't happen overnight. And mm -hmm. I know you know that too. And you try everything, and with drums in particular, it's been trial. You try it, you try it, you try and get your sound better each time. And, but you don't ever, you don't ever say I've, I've reached a plateau with anything. I, in life, in anything, you've never reached a plateau. You're always striving to do something a little better the next time. And you might reach a point where you stay there and that's what you're gonna stick with until you experiment and get a little bit better. And that's how you kind of walk up the stairs. You don't, you don't run up big stairs. You take little steps towards a goal with any of the instruments, especially drums, I mean, because like you say, the cymbals, a Sabian and a, a Zildjian sound totally different. Mm -hmm. They make cheaper Sabians and more expensive Sabians. And they make cheaper Zildjians and more expensive Zildjians. Find that happy medium and just work your way, kind of slowly work your way up. How many drum kits do you have? Just one. Just one? At the moment, I've had... That's what I meant to say. How many drum kits have you had? <laughs> Probably six. Okay. My very first one was a Premier kit. Uh -huh. I ended up selling that to a friend of mine. Um, I was giving him drum lessons here in town. And then after that, I got three different PDP kits, uh, different versions, different types of wood. Mm -hmm. And then I've had a Mapex as well. But PDP seems to be the thing that I like a lot. Cobus uses that. I don't know mm -hmm. if you just saw the thing with him and um, Casey Cooper at Sweetwater, the drum off or the Sweetwater oh, uh -huh. drum off. Uh -huh. So I use that kit that Cobus has, the X7. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my main thing. I use pretty much like you have here, all Evans heads. I'm using Mino cymbals now mm -hmm. and a combination of the Sennheiser mics, the Slate mics, and uh, some, some every once in a while some Slate uh, drum triggers mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, when you mentioned Sweetwater, I, if you look around, I, you could probably, I could do a Sweetwater commercial. <laughs> Me and Sweetwater are tied. The, the FedEx guy knows my address. You know, he knows it's coming from Sweetwater. <laughs> Same it's here. A, a good good place to get stuff. I'll put a plug in for them because they they deserve it. They do a really good job. 
and they give that extra year warranty on it. Most products only have a one year warranty. Well, they'll warrant, warrant their products for two years and you get to talk to a person. I like that yeah. a lot. So real quick guys, not getting sponsored by Sweetwater, but I do have an amazing rep there. I'm sure you do too. So the advantage of shopping at Sweetwater is you get a dedicated sales engineer so they know exactly everything that you have. So if you have questions, if you get a plug-in, mm -hmm. if you maybe uh, purchase a creation station, they know your whole setup. So they know if everything is compatible, they can ask you why you're interested in a certain type of product and maybe give you a better recommendation. They have great prices, like you said, two-year warranty on everything, generally two-day shipping. I get stuff from them because they're in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm down in Nashville and I get stuff in about two days sometimes, overnight mm -hmm. shipping. Uh, I've literally called them in the morning and the stuff's landed on my porch the next day, that yeah. the next afternoon. But that's not always the case. But within two days, within three days, I don't know that it's ever been that long. Stuff changes so fast. You may think you want one thing and they've got something out that you don't know about. I'll buy something for the quality, kind of find that happy medium. Don't go overboard, but buy something for the quality that's going to last a little bit longer and it's going to be there for you then versus if you can, buying something just real, real, real cheap. Especially anything analog. Analog is going to last. Digital, I was still just telling this to another friend of mine, anything you've got digital right now in 10 years will be completely obsolete. And that's a scary thought. So funny that you mentioned that. I was at an industry event with Vance Powell. He runs Sputnik Sound. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's on uh, Pyramix.net and some things. Mm -hmm. But he made that same exact point. He was actually kind of giving Stephen Slade a hard time. And he was talking about, I've got my 64 channel SSL. I've had it since 1984. Mm -hmm. Still works to this day. He was kind of giving Stephen Slade a hard time about the Raven. He's mm -hmm. like, guess what? in about two years, your digitizer is gonna go out in that Raven, but I'm still gonna be working. <laughs> right, exactly. But yeah, like you, like you said, analog gear is tested, been tested through the, mm -hmm. the years and the time. And, it's and the still, di like I said, the digital will change, and you know, the digital will change year after year, upgrades, upgrades, and you, you kind of chase the dog's tail. If you're in a business, that's kind of what you have to do. But the analog gear, whether it be a good analog mic or a good analog preamp or a, an instrument, an analog instrument, oh, they some of them will increase in value. Talking about that, do you want to show me the new mics that I think you might have just had oh, dropped Oh, yeah, off? yeah, I will. All right, so we've explored the live room. We've explored the isolation room for vocals and acoustic guitar. We just checked out the drums. We are at the heartbeat of the studio barn, but where we left off, we were talking about some microphones. Here at the Studio Barn, John's got a wide variety of clients and artists. I've decided to go with warm audio mic to get some of that vintage analog sound. And I think John said that he's interested in some things like this. He's uh, enticing me. Yeah, he's, I am not. He's pulling me out. I'm gonna get, <laughs> I'm gonna call my engineer when he leaves. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by Warm Audio or anything like that. Not yet, but we'll, when I get to that point, we'll make a video about that. <laughs> but I guess for the moment, could you tell me about the heartbeat of your studio, the setup, some of the gear, why you got it? Uh, I guess we can start with pre's or whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, I can turn them on, the, have the VUs kind of Have them slash up. As I said before, there's there's basically two sections to this. We have the live room out there with a live system in it that bands can play in or just come out and just play just like you would a, in a live situation. And then totally separate from that is you can just switch over and bring everything in here to record. When you're, when you're setting anything up, I set this up to where it, I wanted quality from the point of entry, which is whether it be a guitar, a vocal, or any other kind of instrument, the point of entry, start with that quality, a, a decent, like a, a, a good microphone, a good guitar, good cable. I've wired the building up with, with great cable, not cheap cable. And then coming in, so the whole front end of your 
recording process is with quality gear. Well, the first thing it hits, first of all, a good player, a good singer, good microphone, good cable, good solid cable comes in to a what we call mic preamps or preamps that basically bring the bring the level of the sound up to something that has a lot of headroom, a lot of floor space, and can get you can capture a lot of good audio from it. And so the, the sound will come in through various parts of the studio and will come into individual pre, what we call mic preamps or preamps. I happen to chose uh, the, the LA610 MK2 is, is probably my main, main preamp. I use it a lot on bass guitar and then the main vocals. And then sometimes I'll use my Summit Audio. It's a, it's a 2BA221. It's, a, it's another preamp. That's another preamp. Those are my two kind of go-to things. I switch those around quite a bit. But then I have, a, I have the drum room is set up with, with mic preamps that are dedicated to each instrument. And once I get them set, and once I get a good sound with them, I kind of pretty much leave them alone. And that's where my, uh, my focus right comes in here. This is an eight channel mic preamp. It's an ISA 828. And the kick, snare, kick, top snare, bottom snare, hat, tom one, tom two, tom three, tom four, run through this focus right. Up here are my overheads. And these, can, these in that room can also be used. A lot of times I'll use them. I'll throw a guitar amp or something in there. But right now they're set to my overheads. The two mics, one of them's over the ride cymbal, one of them's over top of the drum kit. But then I'll utilize, I'll change these around and I'll utilize these as, you know, like I was saying before, uh, sometimes I'll record, I've, re I've actually recorded stand-up bass in there. Sometimes I'll throw a, a guitar amp in there. Or something like that but I'll use these two for that and then these four staying with Universal Audio here these four preamps are assigned to the big room I'll use them anywhere from acoustic guitar to electric piano to organ to anything I need out there there's four of them there's four individual mic pre's that I'll use so in total I have 16 there's 16 inputs so that those inputs all come into the these preamps. Out of these preamps, I go into what's kind of the the prize of the studio is getting uh, any any digital studio is having good converters because mm -hmm. that conversion is is taking that analog signal and converting it to a digital signal. And if if that's a cheap process, you're going to get a cheap product. So if you, your converters are very very important. So when, when that analog signal comes out of these mic pre's and goes into what I have as the Apogee's Symphony system, it's not cheap, but it gives you a good solid conversion from analog to digital. And I've got 16 inputs and 16 outputs. In other words, I can record 16 tracks at one time. And that may not sound like very many, but if you think about it, it's, it's enough. I've got 10 separate drum tracks, and then I've got six other tracks that can be assigned to bass guitar, keyboard, a vocalist, a couple of guitars, acoustic guitar. Then once you've got all those basic tracks down, for overdubs, I've got 16 more. I can, uh, you know, I've got plenty of inputs. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is to get as good of digital converters as you can, you can afford. It's like the stylus on your record player. That good stylus is going to get you the, the quality into the, the system, which takes us over to the DAW system. And I've got basically two DAWs I use, and I, I love them both. I use Logic, and I primarily use Logic for, and I've used it commercially. I've used it on lots of stuff. In fact, that's all I used for a long time, but mainly for songwriting and you can't go wrong with it. You get, for the price of a digital workstation, I don't think you can beat Logic Pro, but you, you, have, to, you have to have a Mac. That's, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing. You, you, and I would encourage you, I'm a Mac person. I, I could do Mac videos. Everything's Mac with me. iPhone, iPad, everything, I, laptops. My computers are all Mac. Everything's Mac. Anyway, if you know me well, you already know that. <laughs> But anyway, Logic 
comes with so many virtual instruments and plugins that you really don't need anything else. And another good advantage of it is that when, when the Macs upgrade, Logic upgrades. You're not chasing the dog's tail as far as your upgrades go. So if, if all you want to do is get good recordings, Logic is a very, very, very good program. And it also has something for songwriters that I find very, very good. It's got a, a, an actual, most, most dolls you can create a audio uh, track, you can create an instrument track, you can create a MIDI track, you can create different tr stereo track. Logic has this thing called Drummer. The drummer track in Logic, you don't have to go outside of it. You can, lit you can literally have a handful of drummers right there within Logic, and you can build. This will encourage you to even write and do other things. Literally throw the drummer down and start playing to him. That's something a lot of dolls don't have. You've got to bring in or you've got to create your own drums as a, as a tool where Logic has drums right there and several different drum kits, several different drummers percussion kits that to me for songwriters that is a huge huge advantage with the program you get so many virtual instruments you get you literally get all of the like 72 gigs worth of sounds I think yeah your your uh, wow. your Apple loops are all in there yeah, your, loops. your Apple loops and I use them there are thousands I can't I can't remember what it was but how many thousands of loops you get yeah and this all comes with the program yes yeah, all built in. Uh, no need for an eye lock. Like you said, everything is upgradable. You also have Pro Tools. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, I love Pro Tools too. I wasn't an initial Pro Tools user, so I don't go back very far with Pro Tools. But as I got into Pro Tools in a commercial setting, working with bands especially, it, it's very intuitive. It's very straightforward. It's just set up like a regular mixer like I grew up with. Because I, when I came into the, the love of music when I was young, well, I grew up like everybody. I, I, I banged on some drums and I had me acoustic guitar and things like that. And then uh, we got a couple guys together and we started this little band and this was back in the early 70s. And you know, my music knowledge grew from there. And uh, then you get it, then you finally, you know, can get a PA system, you know, wow. And if you owned the PA system, you almost owned the band because if you had the PA, you, you know, whoever had the PA, that's where you, that's where you played, you know. And that's uh, how my house was when I lived here in Evansville. I, I had the PA, I had the space, I had the recording stuff. I was so a everybody drummer, came so to your house. They sure did. <laughs> well, anyway, it, it, and my knowledge around stuff like that has basically been grown from from there up and I just uh, eventually added a little more to the toolbox as far as equipment goes and but what I wanted to say about a mixer Pro Tools was set up on that basis it's set up like a like a you would have a regular mixer and it's from A to Z it's set up like that and it's been set up like that all along when I jumped into the Pro Tools thing is when they became not so proprietary because used to with Pro Tools, you had to have their own converters. You had to use the, all their stuff. Now you can use other other things, and that's kind of when I jumped in there. And for me personally, when I do commercial stuff and when I do stuff for other people, uh, I like to use Pro Tools. There's some editing things I like in there, and being the fact that it is so, it kind of got the jump on in the digital realm. It really jumped out there ahead of a lot of other products and got embedded into the studios all over the world actually and so if you're doing it if you're in a commercial setting having pro tools and being able to to you know send files with pro tools and send sessions pro tools sessions to other studios it's really something you would need to look into for songwriters and everything else logic i mean you really don't need to go past there but those are my two Logic Pro and Pro Tools are my two. They're my everything. That's what I learn. That's what I. That's what I work on. Yeah. Uh, when I started Pro Tools, this was back in 2008, and it was Pro Tools Seven, I think. And um, I had an. I think I mentioned it in there. I had an Inbox Eight, or uh, 
or an inbox too and uh, mm -hmm. I still have it but I upgraded to the C24 that mm -hmm. was made by Avid or not Avid uh, Digi Design at the time and once it got to a certain level on Pro Tools this was incompatible it was a interface and mixer but now Avid has taken over and you can use just about any interface that you want. I'm using mm -hmm. all, mostly Focusrite, but I've still got an Apollo. I do have an Apogee. Um, some mm -hmm. of those I've brought with me um, mm -hmm. while I'm here on this trip to do some mobile recording. So it's mm -hmm. very uh, flexible. And I know we've talked about this before. Okay, it's not, you know, you can have 20 reverbs or, or 20 delays or 20 compressors and not know them very well. It's not, it's not, how many you have it's what you have how well you know it because if, if you know a, a compressor very well and it's a, a decent quality compressor you're going to get a good final product if you don't know it very well it doesn't do you a lot of good to have you know 10 other compressors that's a wow factor oh i got all these well do you know how to use them and what's your go-to compressor that you know how to use really well to get that good product same with a doll you know, you get a digital uh, audio workstation, that's what DAW means, uh, like Pro Tools or Logic, the, the two I use. Know it well. Dig in. Go into every tutorial you can. Go to workshops wherever you can. And that's how I built my knowledge up. I, you know, the love of music took me to the love of running sound, running live sound, learning different boards, learning how... Uh, uh, audio works in general, you know, learning signal path, gain structures and things like that. So and you important. just keep building on that. And then you go to get to a point to where, okay, now you're in the digital realm and you have to learn all the different shortcuts of each product and how to get around in that very well and not, you know, not defeat yourself by doing stuff and making mistakes. And then when you do make a mistake, learn from it and build from it and just day after day after day, and you build yourself up to a point to where you can actually produce something and do stuff of good quality. And it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, you can go to uh, Pro Tools class somewhere and for a week and think you're gonna come out and be the, the guru. It's just, that's just not how it works. It's, it's mixing hundreds of songs and being in hundreds of live situations and something bad happens and you chase that thing down and you find out what happened and you learn from it and you come back and then when it happens again you go right to it and you fix it real yeah. quick because of that that that's what ha it, it's the school of hard knocks and uh, I'm all for education but education comes in many forms and there's so so much out there right now tutorials on all this stuff we're t on anything we're talking about there's a tutorial on it uh, not just music. I mean, you know that. You can get mm -hmm. on YouTube and find out, you know, anything. Uh, take advantage of all that if you want to be an engineer. I can show you a little bit here. Uh, I just had the cool opportunity to upgrade my Pro Tools system. And I went from a 2018 perpetual license to a 2021 subscription. Nice. Something that happened in Logic and it was in lots of other dolls way before pro tools sometimes doesn't kit doesn't you know they they don't do stuff as fast as other ones but when they do it, it it's pretty good I, I can remember back when pro tools was just didn't have any color to it it just mm -hmm. looked so bland and logic had some color to it and people like color that's that was one little thing it was just and like, now you've got even dark mode even on pro tools yeah and and, and the color in pro tools now it's not, it's almost like it's past everybody but something kind of cool, and I'll show it to you real quick here, with a change in, in, in uh, Pro Tools 2021, Logic had a thing called stacks. Track and stack, basically yeah. they work like subgroups, where you'll group a whole section of like all the drums, and you'll subgroup, you'll do different EQs, different compressions on each, each, in, each drum, kick, snare, you'll do that, but then you'll sub it over to a whole group a, sub, a stereo subgroup, and you might put some stuff in there too. You might put a multi-band compressor or, or a few things in there. But now you'll also have a you'll have a volume, and you'll have those drums condensed into one area. You can put another compressor in there and bring the whole kit together, like we were talking in the drum room. Mm -hmm. You bring that together as an entire instrument. Well, Logic had, instead of having you didn't have to have subgroups as much anymore. 
you could create what's called a stack. Yeah, the track stack. And, and when they, in that track stack, you could put that stuff. And what's cool about it is you could open that track up, and then you could close it down. And then when you're looking at your screen, you have much more screen availability. Well, I've got an example of what Pro Tools 2021 has done up here. 2021, I've got this all condensed. I've, I've got my timeline is on this screen and my mixers on this screen. Typically in Pro Tools, if you've got one screen, you just hit Command Plus back and forth yes. and you switch back and forth between the screens. I have to have two screens which where, where I can separate them. Dual monitors is great. Just to give you an example, this is this is a template I start out with with a, with a band so that I've already got a lot of stuff in here and all I've got to do is switch the names of the songs. And when I start recording, I can go right to this template. Well, it doesn't look like much right now because they're all, every one of them are closed down. And these this is what Pro Tools did. Like Logic has stacks, Pro Tools now has folders. Now here's my drum folder. Within my drum folder, when I, when I open it, it opens up all my drums. All my drums are in there. And I close it, I don't see it anymore. Okay, I open up the drums. Now, here's my guitars. There's my guitars. Okay, I keep walking over. Here's my sax and my keys. Here's my vocals. Okay, see what I just did? I just ran out of screen space. So if I'm, if I'm messing with this, I've got all this stuff out. And a lot of times I'm not working on all this stuff. I'm only working on the saxophones and the keys, or I'm only working on the drum mix. Well, I can close, just by closing these down, I close them all the way down. Well, if I take this all the way out, I've got a pretty big mixer here mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make it any smaller because I'm, I'm too old. I can't see it, <laughs> you know, so I, I can relate. I, so there's this huge mixer here that I can just break down. If I'm just working on the drums, I can break it down or let's just say I'm working on the sax and the, and the drums and a couple of guitars. Now I break it down, I've got it, I basically kind of got it on one screen. I'll break it down one more. Let's say I'm doing that. Now, I don't know how loud this is going to be, but I'll go ahead and hit this and you'll see. We'll start the... Anyway, the drums will kick in. So here's all my separate channels on my drums. And I can break that down if I'm not working on those. I don't have to see those. I may just be wanting to work on the bass guitar. So that, that was a pretty cool feature. And that's something I did like in Logic that, uh, that Pro Tools didn't have. But now they've got it. But then going back to... Let's just say I've got these open here. Something I like about Pro Tools, it's just a few little things. I like being able to clip, gain, edit. I don't, you can't see my cursor here, but I can edit this, this clip by just going right there to that square. That's something I like in Pro Tools that's not in Logic. But in Logic, if I want to expand this here, all I got to do is take my two fingers and hit right here Oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. This is a real cool thing in Logic. You just take your fingers and expand, expand that. It. Well, in Pro Tools, you got to hit R and T. R and T is the big. You got to know R and T in Pro Tools because that's what expands and contracts your regions. It's mm -hmm. little things like that that you get used to uh, between DAWs. But back to the main thing. If you're using Ableton Live, I know a lot of guys doing that, and they ask me, "Oh, you use Ableton?" You know, I, I could, I guess I could, but I don't know it like I know these. If Whatever you're using, if you're using Personas, Logic, Pro Tools, go in all the way. Dump, dump your whole body into it, you know, and learn the program. And you, then you'll develop skills that, uh, you know, your friends will be amazed. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So. The only, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you for showing that. Uh, the the yeah console the consoles it's a it's a solid state logic I can start stop I can pan I can do it's a, it's a huge glorified mouse basically 
Yeah. And if you can see up here, if I move this fader, these faders move. If you want to do any kind of automation, panning, whatever song you have up, whatever's labeled here is labeled here. I myself, I like a mouse too, but I, I've gotten used to it. The trackpad. A lot of people don't like trackpads. I've gotten used to it because I do my fingers like that. But this is just an extra tool to have with this. You don't have to have this in your DAW. It's kind of it's kind of one of those extra things. It's nice, and in a com commercial setting, it, it's really nice because it gets you back to that, like I was saying, that, that the old days of analog. You've got faders in front of you instead of like here. I can move I can move one fader at one time when just using a trackpad. Well, here I can move. Multiple. With this, I can move multiple faders at one time. I have stuff like that, and then the pans are right here. A solo buttons, mute buttons for each track are just right here. If I solo something, it's gonna it's gonna show up up there. So whatever I do up there will show up. Vice versa. It's called a digital controller, and SSL makes a very good one. There are a lot of other good ones out there. Talk to your Sweetwater representative. For sure, <laughs> best of the best. I know you've you've used them. You've used them a lot. Controllers and oh yeah. Um, everything from the C24, I've had the Digi-03, uh, the Digi-03 racks, pretty much all that's avid now. I'm kind of like more focused right at the moment, but yeah, I use a wide variety. Mm -hmm. I know a real popular one now is that Personas. Yeah. I know I've got a couple of friends that are really uh, using that. I'm looking at that, the fader port, a 16 channel mm -hmm. bankable uh, mixer, so. That's, that's the one a friend of mine's got. He, he would recommend it. When you're done here, you basically take everything out to a master, depending on how you're gonna master, you're gonna take it out to a master fader. You're gonna bounce it down to a stereo track and it's gonna go, When it, I haven't talked anything about this, but and we talked about it earlier. A lot of people do this. They get into a buying of the newest plugin that comes out and before long you've amassed all these plugins and then you turn around and realize you don't really use all those. You've got them, and that, in a commercial setting, it's nice to have them because I'll have somebody walk in the door and they'll, they'll want a specific plug-in. That's cool, but if you're into songwriting and you're just, you know, you're not in a commercial situation, just get a few good plug-ins, and the ones that come with Logic, I'll tell you right now, are very good. You may only need to add a couple more to have a very, very nice set of plugins. But this all goes, goes through the plugin. I call it the plugin game because you got plugins, you got all different kinds of plugins that you put on the channels. Then you got other kinds of plugins you put on the, well, even in these stacks or the folders, you put plugins there as a group plugin. And then you've got your mastering plugins and stuff like that. And there's a wide variety of all kinds of brand names. That's the plugin challenge. <laughs> Once you buy a plug-in, you'll start getting, you know how you get all the uh, ads and the texts and the and the emails and we're having our sale today and da 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 and you think Waves, you, $29. Yeah, waves day. $29. But anyway, when it all moves through there and it goes down to your master track, you bounce that out to your friends on Facebook or you bounce it to a CD or you compel a CD. I, I use a program called Hoffa which you put basically, if you're gonna make a CD, you put everything in there. Everything's normalized and the songs all have the right lengths to them, starting points, stopping points, and everything's labeled right and can be coded to where those songs can then be taken to iTunes and places that have the digital codes on them so people can't steal your music and things like that. Yeah. You send that out from your master and that's kind of the the whole process. And if you look over here, I've hey, I've still got cassette players that's a, that's an old hard drive, old 24 track hard drive. There, it was the initial brain of this whole studio. I had a, a Mackie, a digital eight bus, and a and a, a Mackie HDR 24 was the was the, you know, that was one of those steps up. Like I was saying before, when you you start and you just kind of work your way up with your knowledge, mm -hmm. and how to edit and how to do things, and and it's trial and error because you'll make several mistakes and you'll come back and you'll, the next time you do it, you won't make that mistake. Talking about hard drives, I imagine you've got one there and like a, maybe a G drive. The the formula I use here, and I have to have to because it's a, a it's a commercial setting and people own the songs that are on these drives. I can't be stuck with just one hard drive with with their you know their paid for collection of music. 
whether it's paid for or not, it, it's, it's the it's, same, same principle. You do not want to just have all your songs and data in one place. It's like pictures and everything. You need to have them in other places. I've went G-Tech pretty much all the way. Me too. But I go here. It's my main. If you look up here, I can, I can close this. Oh, and there's the Apogee mixer, by the way. Right there, that's actually the mixer mixer that comes into the system. But this is my main hard drive in here. And when I open that, it's, I keep it, keep things very simple. If I There's my two programs right there. You see them, Logic, the stuff I do in Logic, and the stuff I do in Pro Tools. When I hit Pro Tools, here's some, here's some of my clients from here. And then this is, where I'll, this is where I keep the files. When I'm done with a session, what I'll do is I'll put this drive in. And it will come up. In my studio, it's called Studio Barn Backup. When I hit it, a lot of the stuff looks the same. The only thing I really put in here is my backups for this. I don't, I don't have all these other things in there. So when I, I'm done with the session and it's all recorded to this drive here, before I leave, I, I click on that session, I drag it over to this drive right here and you'll, a little pop-up window will come up, and if you want to merge it, it'll just merge anything that wasn't on that, on there before, it'll merge onto that drive, and then when I leave the room, when I, when I shut everything down out here and go in, I take that drive with me and I put it in, the, in a safe in the house, and I just repeat the process, and that way I've got something on this drive and most of the times I will even dump it in my computer in there so it's actually in it's on a hard drive in the house it's in my computer room in there and it's also in here you know when I'm done with the band the band's done they're satisfied or the whoever's doing the works is done satisfied I take the files into my editing room in the house and I edit in there and then that, that's where I come up with my final product that's where I do my masters at and things like that nice yeah, so important to back up your backups. Never want to have a paying client come in and you lose their work. Once you have that happen, hopefully that never happens. Happened to me on my very first client when I did my studio about three years ago. Uh, so that's embarrassing. Try to prevent that if you can. What's at the heartbeat as far as uh, your computer? Well, I've got what's called the, in layman's terms, it's called the trash can. That's they don't make this one anymore. Can. But it was supposed to be the new, and, the, and and it works fine. It works fine for what I'm doing. What you have to be careful with, and I say this with anything, I don't care if it's the iPad or iPhone or whatever, especially a computer like this, because the memory in this computer, it's not designed to keep all the memory in here. It's designed to keep the memory right. in there. The only, the only memory you keep in here is your apps, your Pro Tools and your Logics and your final cuts you keep the apps in there and you keep that storage down in there and yes. you put all your data which creates videos and audio creates a lot of you know storage needs a lot of storage space you got to make sure it's going to the right place you don't want it to go in that's why everything everything is assigned to go into here all my audio I when I save it I save it to a separate hard drive that's a key because uh, yes. You think you're going to buy a laptop and, and save everything and you start doing audio work, you're not going to save everything in the laptop. In fact, you don't want to save anything in the laptop. No. You want to save everything to a hard drive. Uh, absolutely critical. Keep your, keep your software on your laptop, mm -hmm. but save all, save all your projects in, in an external point or the cloud. Or Actually, I know, a, I know a friend of mine, he does everything from the cloud. Yeah. He calls everything up from the cloud. Yeah, so many ways to do that. We transfer Dropbox is still around. That's most of the ones I use, but I mean, mm -hmm. even Google Drive. I mean, I'm sure there's others. Make sure to back up your stuff. I guess the other question, I guess kind of wrapping things up, as far as like your monitoring situation, what do you have as far as your speakers in here? When I went with the Mackie system years ago, I went with the HR824. They're a good speaker. I'm not sure if that's the same number they make today, but they make something very similar to that. That's a good stereo monitor. The Alesis, that was from a, kind of another era. It's, it's quite a bit cheaper. A good reference monitors, a good, good set of headphones. If you, can't get, if you can't get some decent reference monitors, I would go with a good 
quality set of headphones because your monitors are going to mean a lot to you in the long run. Uh, Absolutely. You're gonna, and and the, the, the room you're in when you're editing and stuff like that is a huge factor. Edit at lower volumes. Don't crank it way up because the farther you crank it up, every room's got issues. So your, your acoustical vibes in your room, your oral X and things like that you put in your room to knock down the standing waves are very important because if you're mixing and you're, you're wanting to hear the bass out of the speakers and you're hearing the bass not only out of the speakers, but it's bounced off that wall, that wall, that wall, and you're trying to mix and edit based on what you're hearing, you're getting a false reading. You need sure. to hear you need to hear a, a straightforward representation. A very yeah. active representation of the whole spectrum, audio spectrum, is very, very important. It's kind of stuff like that you learn as you go through the school of audio hard knocks. You kind of learn that as you go. All I can do is say, set up a radio in a gymnasium and turn it up and tell me what you hear. That you don't want to hear that in a studio when you're mixing. You don't want to hear anything close to that. And you're laughing because you've probably done it I've before. I've done that. I've been there. I've been that guy for sure. <laughs> Your band's playing on the basketball floor of the stadium. Or if you've ever, yeah, been in a high school gymnasium when they're having a, a rally or the yeah. pep band's playing. Mm -hmm. When I pay, played uh, drums and pep band at a basketball game, you know, that, that stuff is just sounds bouncing around. The rest are blowing the whistles. That's shrieking up. It's going everywhere. It's the same thing in a less, maybe, you know, not as exaggerated just as that condense. in a room, room when you're, now you're trying to make, you, you know, you're trying to create a project of something somebody's recorded and you're dealing with that, but it just, it's like, it's like, you know, trying to have surgery on a wet noodle. It just won't work. It just, it just, uh, well, this is a, this is a studio barn. Uh, we're out here in the country and I think I've got a pretty comfortable place. Got a lot of friends with some knowledge on instruments and they have a lot of musicians that can come in and help anybody on their projects. And I love doing this, and that's the other thing. You find somebody, find a studio, or find somebody you know, like Polly here that, that, that loves it. You've already got half of it licked because if they love it, they want to give you something good You know, versus somebody that don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first telltale sign of getting somebody good, somebody that's passionate about what they do. That's what you want. I mean, if I was having heart surgery, I, I would want a passionate heart surgeon, Yeah. Uh, not somebody that's just punching a clock. Yep. This is my life right here, right now. I'm kind of do, I do this 24/7. So, well, this has definitely been an amazing studio tour. It's a beautiful facility, like you said. It's very quaint, kind of off the beaten path. It's just very beautiful. If you need to take a relaxer, a breather, there's a the beautiful lake. There's fields. It's a beautiful day out here in southern Indiana, and just coming out here is just it feels relaxing. It feels mm -hmm. like a homey place. It's somewhere that I actually would want to come and record. So like when I get some more time, I'll have to track some drums and do some yeah, projects. Yeah, I, and... I think you probably are a studio drummer, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> just a, little bit. a little bit. You know what works and what doesn't work. And, yeah. yeah. Like you said, it's the process of experimentation, just getting in there and trying it. If it doesn't work, if you make a mistake, okay. It's mm -hmm. going to happen, but guess what? You learn from it, you grow, you get better, and eventually, after some time, you have a place like this. Yeah. It's a disease, kind of. It is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a cool disease. It's, it's, a, it's a good addiction. It's a, it's a positive <laughs> thing, turning uh -huh. somebody's project coming in from that first call. Hey, I think we want to uh, do something. Okay, cool. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about pre-production. You get in here, they see the spot, the vibes are flowing. Mm -hmm. You get in here, you're very passionate about this. I'm sure that when musicians, people come in, it's an exciting time. I'm sure, like today, it's gone by so fast. I can't believe that you know we've been here for so long. It's been so much fun. But I'm sure it's like that for a lot of the uh, sessions that happen here. And yeah, definitely, if you're gonna need a place to come in the Evansville, Boonville, Henderson area, look John up on Facebook. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Give me a shout on Facebook and you'll see, you'll see how to get a hold of me and uh, get you down. 
or if you just want to chat, if you're if you're an aspiring sound engineer and you just want to chat a little bit, I'm I'm available. I I like talking, as you well can see. <laughs> <laughs> I like talking this stuff. I mean, I like talking shop with recording stuff, and I'll learn from I'll learn from you just like you might learn something from me. Very cool. Well, we've had our tour of the studio barn. If you want to get a hold of John, you know where to find him on Facebook on the Studio Barn. Well, I thank you so much for having me out today. This has You're been welcome. so much fun. We got some great footage. This is going to be this is going to be a great video. Cool. Pleasure to have you down here. Thank you. Oh, and I need you to come back and uh, share some of your talent and definitely collaborate quite a bit more. Looking forward to it. Absolutely, for sure. Looking forward to finally meeting you. I've yeah. talked to you on Facebook. We've been uh, doing the social media thing. You probably look at all my food pictures. <laughs> that's, that's been awesome, inspiring throughout the pandemic, for I sure. I like to cook, too. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks. All right. All right, we have successfully completed our tour of the studio barn in my hometown area. Here's an amazing sign. It was so much fun. I got to see the live room, the drum room, the isolation room, and the control room. We had some good talks, good chats. We got some good footage. Thank you so much, John, for having me out. Until next time, guys, my name is Paul the Fifth. Fifth.